Sorry. Welcome to the latest Aquarium Rush podcast brought to you from the Watercolor Studios. <laughs> brought to you live from the Watercolor <laughs> Studios in downtown St. Louis, Missouri. My name is Larry. Uh, um, I, uh, flip it, reverse it, <laughs> something. Strike that, reverse it. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. So this is not the Aquarium Rush now you're going to get it backwards again. Right. I'm going to mess You're it trying all up, to be right? funny and now. <laughs> Here's the podcast from the Watercolors Aquarium Gallery, not live, brought to you from downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan. My name is Ben. I'm Amy. And I'm Charles. And today we're going to be talking about information and how to get good information and misinformation. Yeah. <laughs> how to find bad information. <laughs> like, how to <laughs> identify it. <laughs> So why is this topic so important in, the, in this, we'll, we'll call it the misinformation age. And <laughs> there it is right there. Our number one source of looking up information is the internet. Mm-hmm. How do you weed through what's good information, what's bad information, what's true, what's not true? Yeah. How do you really find out what's going on? And sometimes it's even harder when you've got someone standing in front of you telling you something, you want to believe them, you know? And how do you, how do you weigh that against some like, anonymous person online? Right. That's a big question. <laughs> so when I was researching for this podcast, and believe it or not, I actually did some research for this one, I simply Googled the 10 easiest saltwater fish. Mm-hmm. And, oh, this should be good. <laughs> right. And the very first heading that comes up is, and, and, and I'm not going to give you the website because, you know, that would be, I'd be pointing out, I don't know, something. Um, but 18 best saltwater aquarium fish for beginners. Number one, tangs. Is, that's it? Tangs. D- tangs. Tangs. So they're not talking about, so I would say a scopus tang, for the right beginner, it could be a good fish. Yeah. But how about a flamingi that gets two feet long? Yeah. Right? And then it's watchman goby. Just watchman goby. Okay. Just watchman goby. Right. I mean, at least does apply to a group of fish that are generally... <laughs> Some of them are okay. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's chalk bass, and I would say a beginner with chalk bass, that's not horrible. Yeah. Then it says damselfish. <laughs> we, if you listen to our podcast, you know how we feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> how do you... I mean, like 99% of damselfish are going to be unacceptable aquarium fish. Exactly. <laughs> Unless yes. you keep them by themselves. Exactly. Okay. Then it's dotty back. There's a whole lot of dotty backs out there. A whole lot of red. Some of them so, are great. Some of them are terrible. So far we've listed about like 50% of aquarium fish. Yeah. And, and <laughs> very few of them that are actually good beginners. Yeah. Then it says clownfish, which, okay. They got one right. Then firefish. That's not yeah, horrible. Yeah. Could say that. And then coral beauties. That's not no. That's a horrible. Right. Then it says Talbot's damsel. What is Talbot's damsel? Well, that's one of those damsels that they they come in as as really pretty little juveniles and they're pretty peaceful and they're great and then they turn into six inch mean brown fish. <laughs> yeah. Right. And they already said damsels. They already said damsels. <laughs> right. Then wasses. Uh. So are they talking about the ones that get six feet long? Right, or the, the Napoleon rest. Yeah, I'm sure is that's got to be the one. Or the possum rest that gets, you know, two and a half inches. Yeah, they're, the right. care is equivalent. They're probably talking about the six-line rest, which <laughs> if you listen to our podcast on six-line rests, well, let's just say this. I don't think it's a good beginner. <laughs> it's like if they had put six-line, I would have said, well, yes, but also no. Right. <laughs> We're at number 11, the pajama cardinal fish. Okay, I was, I, I'll give them that one. Blenny fish. Quote unquote, Blenny fish. Blenny fish. That's what it says. Blenny fish. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and this one's, this one's, I don't know, this might be the best one on here. Butterfly fish. What? I don't know if any, that anyone would describe any butterflies as beginner fish. I Maybe. Think I would put a Klein. Yeah, Klein. That's the if only it's one. well conditioned. Some butterfly fish, you just can't keep in captivity unless you feed a live coral. Then Molly's. Well, uh, we've proven that that's doable, I guess. Then green chromis. <laughs> asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's just, it's heartbreaking to read lists it like is. this. This is like, if, if somebody who doesn't know anything about fish is like, I need to learn, I need to start my saltwater aquarium. They're going to open this up. They're going to look at this list. 
and someone put this list out there right on purpose thinking they knew what they were talking about or thinking that they could it, and really this is where the big problem comes it's when our information is coming from like non-honest sources like right. cuz this is all about well if they can get you to their website, then they've done their job. And they're, if they list every single fish, then sure, if you search for it, it this, their list comes up first. And yeah. they've won, right? But like, there's no even integrity in the article writing. Like, you know, it's inconsistent. It's not thorough. It's not well described. Like, it's just poor information. It's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. As, as a contributor to the hobby, I'm embarrassed by that. We've, we failed there. Yeah. Well, that, I don't even think a hobbyist would have written that. Like, it would have just been somebody who also Googled it who made it from other lists. Like, that's got to be it. Because they don't even know the names of them. Right. Like, they don't even know how to describe it. Right. <laughs> it's frustrating. Yes. The amount of times we go through and research a topic, we flippantly go, well, that's stupid. Well, that's wrong. Right. Page two or three, okay. okay. <laughs> Here's someone who knows what they're talking about, or at least might. Hey, they at least referenced, referenced something appropriate. Yeah. Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> I actually, I was at a, um, I'm trying to say this carefully. I was on the website of another aquarium store. Um, that's, a, that's where I'm going to leave that. All right. And on their blog, on their website, and this was a store that I would consider fairly reputable in person, let's say. Okay. Um, and they had a pic, they had an article that was like best fish for beginners, or best freshwater fish for beginners, and they had a picture of a yellow tang as the cover photo. Because it was just it, it was like a one an article like that that was like so like just generated that didn't have any like actual connection to the subject it was just like these are fish that exist <laughs> i'm quiet because i'm like i'm in pain over here <laughs> <laughs> well charles is has been recently our, our resident like he's been doing a lot of the more intensive research so that it frees up ben and i to do other things and he's really good at it so i can see how you personally would be offended by this <laughs> i mean so it's been touched on in the intro, but my schooling was in science. And actually part of that is learning how to sift information properly. And so, I don't know, I assume the feeling I get when I see stuff like that is like probably the same way that some mechanic sees the way I mistreat my car. Like it probably, <laughs> like it probably gives them the same like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... I how do we get from that list to saltwater fish that are keepable? Like, how do you get from that piece of information to actual knowledge? That's, that's, the, that's the challenge. Right? right. So let's first talk about here's the sources of information, right? The Internet, obviously, is the biggest source of information. And so we've got we've to figure out, we've got to talk about how to sift through websites to determine what has some credibility and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Other people. How do you sift through advice yeah. to determine whether that advice is credible or not? Books and magazines. Probably a higher likelihood of credibility. Right. A more, maybe I would say, a more reliable, reliably credible? Does that, is that redundant? I think redundant? it depends on... Um, where you're looking. And it really all does. But, like, I've seen plenty of beginner aquarium books that are kind of... Right. <laughs> but, like, when you pare down to, like, a book that's actually on a specific subject, that, like, right. that likelihood of that being good information shoots up dramatically compared to general guides. Right. And then the last source would be aquarium stores. Yeah. Right. Or... Maybe we'd even say people that work at places that sell fish. Yeah. Because we're going to get a little bit more broad there, right? Right. As we talk about those, those are our four sources of information. Mm -hmm. So the internet is probably the, the number one go-to source of 
information for anything. It is for me. Just before we started this discussion, Charles and I were lamenting about the fact that we live in an age where every bit of information known to humankind is available at our fingertips right now. And I'm of the opinion that that now means that being wrong is now a choice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) It doesn't mean that, like... You don't. You can't be blamed for not knowing things, but you can be blamed for not attempting to rectify that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's the heart of what I'm getting at. Because, no, I know. like, I don't begrudge anyone that makes a mistake or you've been misled, but it's different to be presented with information and just say, mm, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but how do you address? And maybe this is. Maybe this is going to get us into a little bit of trouble here but maybe how do you address if if someone says well i did my research and look what i found right yeah and how that that website that i was on look i did research i want a butterfly fish they're supposed to be beginner fish right how what is it what are the clues what are what are the things you look for now obviously in that list you could say okay they listed damselfish and they listed Talbot's damselfish, which means something might be a little wrong there. Right. That's Redundancy? A, yeah. Or like but, just, they're like, look, seeing that, they did not take very much care, right? Yeah, yeah. If they didn't edit it, otherwise they're, whoever does their editing would have said, why did you put the same thing on here twice? Yeah. <laughs> Another Maybe check the source and cross-reference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of my tricks, I guess, is... Um, I will occasionally, when I'm reading something and I don't quite know how I feel about its reliability, I will copy and paste like a sentence of it. And if you can get the same result from multiple different articles, that means that people are just generating from the same... Copy and pasting. Yeah, and I immediately don't trust it then. Yeah. Right. Right. Or you go, oh, maybe there's a kernel of truth to this. Let me find where this came from. And sometimes that will lead you to something that is valid because they copied and pasted it from someone who did know what they were talking about. Yeah. Occasionally. Mm -hmm. For me, most of the time that I start going down that rabbit hole and I can find that it's copying, pasting stuff, I can track it down to an original source that I'm like, "Mm -mm." yeah, (laughs) I'm not into it. (laughs) But then you can make the determination based on like not a copy of a copy of a copy. You can be like, this is the information. Oh, that's trash. (laughs) Yeah. One of my biggest red flags, is, and this applies far beyond the aquarium hobby, is overgeneralization. Right. The article that you listed, overgeneralization, butterfly fish, damselfish. Tangs. Tangs. Right. Um, we're probably going to mention them several times in this because they are a, a lot of the times the bright light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, seriously, fish, Yeah. They're, they usually you'll see a lot of shoulds and coulds and usuallys. And that's when you're like, okay, well, if they're mitigating it and not saying that this is 100% true, then at least somebody's thinking about it in some way. <laughs> and at yeah. least critically. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, that you make another good point there. One of the things that you see on Seriously Fish is you see a scientific nomenclature. Mm-hmm. And when people use big words appropriately, it's often a good sign. Yeah. The Uh, presence of scientific names to me, I think, is a... That's a great start. (laughs) That's a good start, yeah. It's a great start. I also appreciate Seriously Fish, like, oh, I first, quote-unquote, fell in love with them when uh, they would release, like, update articles for, like, so this is the updated taxonomy for this group of fish. This new study came out, so this is all wrong, so we're going to have to update some of these articles. But until then, this is our reference for what's happening on the website. And I was like, oh, that's cool. (laughs) Similar note to uh, scientific nomenclature, but citing sources. Yeah. So, Uh. Charles, you touched a little bit there on, on, on an important aspect of this, and that's the scientific process. And I think that's something dramatically lacking in lots of information out there in the world today. So the scientific process, you mentioned peer review, and that's such a big part of truly getting something published on the scientific level is a peer review. Yeah, that's a pretty tricky process. Um, A lot of people, at least 
in my life seem to think that it's something that happens pretty readily and it's not. Um, I personally have never written a peer reviewed article, but I did work with people who were working on stuff and it was, it's so strange to see someone works like years on this topic and then they'll get it back and they're like, uh, the ambiguity in your writing is the only reason that this isn't being published. Write it again. And then maybe we'll consider it. And I'm like, wow. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so what peer review means is, and this is when you see a published scientific paper, when you see something put out, put out there, backed up by sources, in fact, and, 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 and called peer reviewed. What that means is that person studying that topic, writing that paper, before it was published, they put it out to a whole bunch of people whose job it was to prove it wrong. And they reviewed it and couldn't prove it wrong. A whole bunch of really smart people educated in that topic. So when you see something that says peer-reviewed science, it's probably right. Yeah, that's not just a, we passed around our papers in class and right. my buddy gave yeah. it a gold star. That's, there, there's very specific steps to that process. Yeah. Please allow me to have my rant on this right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the perfect time for it. Yes. Um, a lot of people have a perception that science is changing its mind a lot. Like, oh, eggs are good now. Eggs are bad now. Like, that's not accurate. Two things are happening. A, a lot of these subjects are very specific. This type of cholesterol is good for cells in this specific organ system. Might not be true for another organ system in your body because the chemistry in your liver is different than the chemistry in your heart. Mm -hmm. um, so when people start like retelling it like in news or in secondary literature, they start, the further away from the original source they get, they start getting, it's like telephone. Like these weird add-ons get because attached to it that were never intended in the first article. Like I remember one where the news line was, uh, farts help prevent cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that the scientists to this day are still like, we still get emails about that. That was never a subject in our paper. Poor scientists. <laughs> well, that it brings up such an amazing point about know the goal of your source. Like, Ooh. know their intentions. Right. Because some sources' intentions are to drive you to their website, mm -hmm. which that would probably be the example of the article you brought up. Some sources, their intention is to get you to click on an article. And mm -hmm. that's the fart article. Right. <laughs> so Some yeah, talking about sell you something. Yeah, talking about I don't know whatever that article was actually about. You know that's boring. Farts are funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that brings up another really good point because a lot of the sites out there, their 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 intention is to sell you something, mm -hmm. right? So we're gonna we're gonna do a little experiment here, and we're gonna go with we're gonna go with a naso tang, okay? And I'm just gonna do a Google search on a naso tang. And we're going to go to, oops, <laughs> that's not what I want. We're going to go to Naso Tang, and we're going to go to one of the, we're going to look at two of the very popular online sources that sell Naso Tanks, okay? The first one that comes up, what do they say is the minimum tank size for a Naso Tank? My guess would be 75 gallons. And actually, this says a 180 or larger. Okay. Is what this Well, then I think I know where that site. one's from. Yes. <laughs> All right. And then we're going to scroll down. Because they actually usually do a pretty yes. good job. And the next one for Naso Tang says... I'm going to take uh, 125. Price is right rules. Yeah, I'm giving them no credit. I'm saying 75. <laughs> uh, 100 gallons. <sighs> okay. <laughs> so, one of the challenges, one of the reasons misinformation is so prevalent out there is because people will look for the answer they want. Mm -hmm not the answer that's right. If you're looking at two sources that are both selling you something, and one says 180 and one says 100, the 180 is the correct one. Yeah. The one that's harder to attain, the one that's you're less likely to buy from because of the information, is probably the more accurate information. Yeah. Um, 
the great example was when, when we did the podcast on saltwater fish we don't want to see in the hobby and i had the engineer goby right. like because everybody knows the nasotang's tang's a big fish like i mean if you want one you probably have a good idea that it's going to get a pretty decent size unless you're just showing up cold but uh that one they were saying 10 gallons 15 gallons uh, like pretty much every source that was selling them says under 29 gallons even if you don't get into the elaborate network right. of cave system. It's still an 18-inch fish. fish. <laughs> three feet. Yeah. They'll get three feet long in a 10-gallon tank. Yeah, I was thinking, because a 10-gallon tank is an 18-inch tank, right? 20. 20, 20 yeah. So, like, <laughs> so much better. It literally <laughs> would not fit. It doesn't fit in the tank. Like, you could not put an adult engineer goby in a 10-gallon tank physically. Oh, and this <laughs> information is everywhere. Yeah. So, hey, let's take this experiment one step further, Okay. I need to step away from the microphone for just a minute. Sure. Yeah. Let's do it. The other good source of information, books. Okay. I'm just going to grab one of my books on the shelf, and I think I've got the Tang book there. Uh, Well, he's walking away from the mic. (laughs) (laughs) We can talk about him. Well, I was going to say scientific literature is actually easier to come by than I think most people realize. Google has this amazing search engine inside of it. You know how you can search like images or... Mm-hmm. There is Google Scholar. Yeah. And it that's probably my primary source for looking up information. Um, when I come in and I'm talking about like, oh, so there's information on like epistogrammas in different streams. Yeah. That's where I got it from. Yeah. And it's like if you are one of those hobbyists that does want to dig into like the natural history of your fish and a lot of us do like you'll be shocked at what's available. I was, I like, you know, I've, I sometimes I'll just throw something in there and see what comes up. And like, I threw in buffalo head cichlids and I found a genetic study on their different, like distribution in that river system and how it affects like, and at the time I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And I, but I, I, I did not have the time to actually read it, but like that information is out there. You could know those like really crazy details about the organisms you're keeping. And that's, that's amazing. And it doesn't even have to just be that, like, quote-unquote nerdy aspect. Right. Um, there are studies out there. They're much less common, but there are studies out there on, like, husbandry and what kind of environment stress or don't stress fish. So, like, when people come in and ask me, how many neon tetras should I get or how many tiger barbs should I get, the answer I give them is actually based on studies where, like, the tiger barb answer is based on, well, they tried to study social hierarchies in multiple group sizes in this study, and they found that in group sizes under seven, Mm -hmm. they terminated those trials because there was so much aggression that they did not feel like they would be able to maintain their ethical standing in the ICUC committee at their institute. (laughs) That's funny because I know a lot of people who have three tiger barbs. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if we, I, I, what I did well during that pause there was I quick referred to uh, an actual book about naso tang, right? And according to the book, naso tang needs at least an eight foot tank. So that's even bigger than the 180. Yeah. Okay. Then that's a better, like, length of tank is a better metric for a tang than yeah, that's absolutely tanks true. gallons. Absolutely true. So where do we go with that with you? I mean, you guys, you guys were talking while I was, you know, flipping through books there to try and, <laughs> try and solve this little, this little dilemma on, on how you actually get good information on the Internet. Yeah. Well, here's like the conclusion, I think, to what Charles and I were saying is I don't think that everybody is up for like digging through scientific papers, but... For a lot of sources that we're using, there's a pretty good shortcut. If a scientific paper is cited, you can figure out what that is, and you can determine if that information is valid based on how they validate it by actually providing their sources. Well, and if you want to go just a little bit further, but you don't want to read through all the scientific jargon and stuff, um, the nice thing about scientific papers is there's this nice brief summary called an abstract. Mm -hmm. If you were like oh, this is cited, you look at it, and you can look at the abstract, and you can be like, all right, so they honestly portrayed this paper. There you go. Yeah, even if you don't read through the entire thing, since it's peer-reviewed, you know that that abstract is, let's say, most likely going to be pretty close to accurate. Like, I don't want to say that every scientific paper is always accurate, but 
that goes through some pretty rigorous testing. The phrase I would use is heavily supported by the data available. That's a much better phrase. <laughs> I, like that. I like that. So back to the, the if you're just going to do a little Google search on something. I think some of the big takeaways from that are first, cross-reference. Don't just take the first source of information that you find. Right. Look for other sources. Don't look for the information you want to hear because somebody online is going to say that it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, and even if it is okay, somebody online is going to say that it's not. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we should transition into like hearsay. Like, how do we yeah. forums? I mean, yeah. that's not backed up by anything other than some dude saying he did it. Right. And, and, and some dude who did it once, it must be true then. Yeah. Right. I've seen yellow tanks pick at corals. Therefore, yellow tanks must eat coral. Right. They, they're yellow tanks. For, for those of you that aren't saltwater people, they are one of the most reef safe, i.e. not eating coral fish that we keep. It has happened. It does happen on occasion. It's right. It's super rare. Um, and we should probably say that the reason we're drawn a little bit more towards talking about saltwater in this discussion is I think freshwater fish are a little bit better documented. There's no seriously fish for saltwater. Right. That's so, true. like, w if we have a source of information that's generally good in freshwater, that that gap is definitely wider in salt, I All think. All right. Challenge accepted. Yeah, let's see Best what the beginner of Beginner fish <laughs> freshwater fish. Yeah. And we come up with, we're going to go with the first one. Okay. 10 best aquarium fish for beginner. We're not going to use that one. Yeah. My point is more of that, like, I have a source that I know I mostly trust. But, like, yeah. if you're a beginner, you don't. You don't know which is good and which is not. So this is a good exercise. Right. Low maintenance aquarium fish for beginners. Let's do that one. Okay. Okay. Low maintenance. The first one that comes up is... Oh my gosh, the face he just gave us. What is it? <laughs> Goldfish. No! Why? <laughs> How could they? Uh, That's like the one fish I would, I don't want to keep. <laughs> right. Okay. So what they are saying is the number one beginner fish is a fish that gets nine inches long and can live for over 60 years. Yeah. Yes, that is the goldfish, people. That is how big goldfish get. That is how long they live. Not to mention fish that come basically, you know, out of the box with at least a couple of diseases. Right. So all your things you're saying about, you know, freshwater seems to be better than saltwater. No, you have one no, good source. I have one good source that yeah. I know I can look back on. And that's why I think we're leaning on the saltwater discussion more, right. but there's right. definitely tons of misinformation. Oh, we're going to keep ripping too. freshwater apart. Yeah, so we should. We need to more. One I'm going to say is I, uh, I'll accept it is a neon tetra. I think sure. that's an acceptable, yeah. like, you know, a beginner 10 gallon aquarium with some mm -hmm. neon tetras in it. You betcha. Go for it. Okay. A beta. That's perfectly fine. As long as you put a heater in it. Yep. I'm okay with that. Mollies and platies with live bears in parentheses. <laughs> There's a classic, okay, a seahorse, a whale shark, and many stingrays are live bearers. Yeah. So when they say molly, mollies and platies and live bearers, it is, Amy mentioned it earlier, gross generalizations. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, there's a picture of a guppy. <laughs> it's like saying, like, dogs and also other canines. Right. <laughs> yeah. Zebra fish. They're referring to a zebra Daniel. Sure. By the way, that one, that's, that's as good as saying the best beginner saltwater fish is a clownfish. Yep. Zebra Daniel. No argument against down. that. They're, that is a great choice. They're basically bulletproof. Yes. Yeah. Uh, wait, that was only number five. Is this only five? Uh, maybe, maybe that's all they have is, is five. Okay. So, so, you know, I'm giving them... There actually were four out of five. Yeah. Well, sort of. Okay. One was just completely wrong. One was like overgeneralization. The other three were, yeah. were actually pretty good. And if you're talking about, if you're not nitpicking and you're talking about common live bearers, I, nobody's going to lump in a Gadeid and, uh, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. Because you're just not going to see gonna that do, in stores. They're going to do guppies, platies, mollies. And, and, and then it's fair. Fine. Yeah. So it was a little bit better than the saltwater one. It was. One. I'm it picturing was. like someone in the ALA being like, I would lump them together. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to do one more Just a single tier from the site. ALA member. 
13 best freshwater fish for your home aquarium. Okay. They start with neon tetras. They then go to Daniels. They then go to Platties. They then go to Guppies. They go to Cooley Loaches. Those guys are fun. They go to Cherry Barbs. So far, so good. Firemouth Cichlid. All right. Sure. If you're doing a beginner cichlid, sure. Pearl Garamis, they're fine. Tiger Pleco. What? It's just an Which Pleco is the choice. Tiger Pleco even? That's what they're calling a Tiger Pleco. But, but what Pleco is that? <laughs> I guess maybe it's the 333? The King Tiger, is that a 333? Uh, it's got a picture, which saying Tiger Pleco is I know. Well, completely and then they meaningless. Cory Catfish, which, by the way, there's an entire book over there written on Cory Catfish. There's something like 350 different species and counting. Yeah, that's a big book. Yep. Oh, they, then they say Molly's again, and they have a picture of a balloon Molly. Cute. Which are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> then they do Swordtail. All right. This one's, it's, you know, so, it's you know, not they a did list. pretty good. They it's did pretty good. List. But yep. there are, I mean, there are so many fish that I, are more fun than any of those. I know, I know. <laughs> anyway, that's I mean, a separate point. The, the goldfish one to me is just... It's yeah, that's just ridiculous. The, the classic. <laughs> like, I like to tell people who come in and be like, because we'll, we will have people, like, come in a little shy, a little like, well, look, look, I see all the cool stuff you guys are doing, and do you just have, like, just an easy goldfish for me? And I'm like... No, I don't. Uh, you know, and they, they that's just what they think. That's the opinion. And I tell them, uh, we do have a goldfish, but, like, that's a fish that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. So <laughs> maybe you don't want to try that as your first tank. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, anyway. so we, 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 we talked about the Internet. Yeah. And um, we, we do need to get a little bit back into, I think, forums and... What do you do when you find, when you're searching for an unusual solution and you find an answer that isn't verifiable? Because how often do you look up the answer to your question and all you get is some guy on a forum from five years ago saying that he tried this and it seems to be working? I remember my favorite forum years ago used to have, it had two different categories for every single post and it had number of posts Oh, years as a member and years in the hobby. And it was classic that you'd have these people with three or 400 posts and one year on the board and two years in the hobby. And their three or 400 posts, they had an opinion on everything. Right. When you could see, that if, you could, if you could find out how long somebody's been in the hobby... That's such a good way to determine what kind of impact they have. Because if you write it down in the end and it's on the internet, all of a sudden you see it in writing and you want to believe it. Yeah. And that could be a 13-year-old kid who had an aquarium for six months and now thinks he's an expert. Yeah, or has just been reading a lot of forum posts and parroting whatever he, sa- he yeah. sees, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I used to be very pretty active in forums in the late 2000s. And then... I really won't get into specifics, but I had a, a string of experiences that soured me to that, and I don't touch forums at all anymore. Well, they're often just nasty places. Yeah. Do you like, have a story? Uh, I do, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Not a good story. I, I, have, a, I have a story. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, for, great. For a site, right? So uh, this was probably 10 or 12 years ago, and somebody posted in a forum, hey, can I keep a pistol shrimp? with my cleaner shrimp and I had a pistol shrimp at that point Mm -hmm. and I immediately posted no that's not a good idea pistol shrimp hunt and kill other shrimp right yeah I think flamed is the the term they use on forums where they just they just a whole bunch of people post a bunch of nasty comments about what I just said and how wrong I was blah 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 and yada yada I'm like "What, what do you what are you talking about? I mean, this pistol shrimp, I tried it once. I put a peppermint shrimp in there and I had the, and the pistol, I mean, the, my peppermint shrimp was dead. Yeah. Like it was, it was dead in seconds. Right. And reading through the posts, a couple of people started posting these pictures of these little teeny baby pistol shrimp, that yeah. were like an inch long <laughs> with two and three inch cleaner shrimp. I had a tiger pistol shrimp that was four inches long. The yeah. thing looked like a, the, the, Scorpion from the first Transformers movie coming over the edge of a ridge whenever it came out of its cave. I mean, this was like a full-grown adult pistol shrimp. 
And it was a classic case of those people's experience with their little baby pistol shrimp compared to my experience with my full-grown pistol shrimp was just an extremely different experience. Right. So notice I was really careful. I didn't say they didn't know what they were talking about because they had babies and I had an adult. I said my experience was different. When you're reading something on a forum, you're reading about somebody's experience. Yeah, and people love to correct. Yes. Like people would rather like correct you because of information that they think they know than say, oh man, that's kind of crazy. Mine seems to be working so far, but maybe it won't in the future. Right. Like, you got to sort of take, because I I see it all the time where like a forum, uh, I usually, I frequent some of the ones on Reddit, but I don't do too much. And like, they'll have certain pieces of information that they really cling to. And so like, if you see somebody who's a beginner or doing something a little bit out of the norm, they would rather parrot those rules then say oh how is this working for you this is how i would tweak it this is what i wouldn't do they would rather just say well the minimum tank size for about is five gallons with heater and filter with plants and and it's like well there are there's so many shades of gray and we need to be open to experimentation in this hobby in a humane light like yeah you know yeah. so I, I usually take that stuff with a grain of salt, but it does give you pretty good directions to experiment in if people have something they feel strongly about. Uh, in the scientific community, we would term this as anecdotal evidence, which is right. considered one of the least strongest forms of evidence. And one of my mentors in college, she liked to use the phrase, a ton of bad evidence does not equal an ounce of good evidence. True. I like that. Yeah. Yep. I like that. But I don't want us to be so caught up in... Because for some things, there just is not that much scientific literature. We've been working on culturing Asterina stars around the shop. And really, we've there's not a ton of like, well, this is just how you do that. So we do have to play around with some things. And if we heard a rumor of somebody doing it some way at some point, and it's not going to hurt us to try it, then we'll try it. Like, yeah. Even though, even if there's not that documentation that says specifically that's what you have to do. I just don't want to discourage people by thinking you have to track everything you do in an aquarium back to a scientific paper because you often can't. That's true, but there's a distinction between... Give me a second how I want to word this. Yeah. Anecdotal evidence is different than, like, this is what's worked for me. Right. Anecdotal evidence is one person's opinion. There's a difference between one guy's success and a swath of people who have done it hundreds of times versus, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's not anecdotal evidence anymore. That is now accumulated data. Right. Yeah. So like your example with the pistol shrimp, I would still call that anecdotal evidence. No, I don't care how many of them commented. None of them had seen that through to the end yet. Right. <laughs> right. Their, right. their little baby one inch pistol shrimp, if they actually stayed in the hobby long enough to let that pistol shrimp grow up, would kill even resident cleaner shrimp in their tank. Yeah. That would happen. It might take a couple of years, but it would happen. Yeah. So, it's all about uh, contextualization <clears throat> and yeah, at that point. Yeah. Like knowing, well... Yeah, they have little ones. I have a big one. This is like, you've got to take the whole picture, not just this is what I'm going to try because this guy said so. So a bottom line on, on, on a topic like this when we're talking about the Internet is, I mean, let's face it. There aren't too many people that are going to say, hey, I'm thinking about starting up an aquarium. I should listen to this podcast by Watercolors. Right. Right. However, a lot of people that are into aquariums might be listening and might what advice do you give people to give people yeah what do you tell what do we as hobbyists project how do you find good information on the internet there's a moment of silence there as well I go ugh <laughs> if, listen if I knew everything would be easier <laughs> that's the challenge right <laughs> Yeah. In the whole world, all of this in- misinformation is out there. And so the, the takeaway for me, for the internet, cross-reference. Yeah. Don't know, treat anyone like an expert source. unless you know they are. Know the source. Yeah. And that's, 
whether we're talking about fish or life. If you read it on the internet, know the source. Yeah, so many people discount their own knowledge and experiences too. Like they will do research when it comes to buy a fish and then if they see somebody else say otherwise, like they'll be like, oh, they know better. But right. they don't always. Like be confident in what you know based on your research and what you've cross-referenced between everybody else's opinions. Don't just take the first advice that's given you because some people are just looking to correct you. Right, right. Advice from fellow hobbyists. That's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. So one of the great sources for advice from fellow hobbyists is aquarium clubs. And I think what happens is a, a, a herd correction that happens in an aquarium club. Yeah. If somebody walks into an aquarium club full of misinformation, they're not just talking to one person that's going to correct that misinformation. They're talking about a herd of people that are cor- going to correct that misinformation. Yeah. So for me, an aquarium club has always been an outstanding source of good, accurate true and up-to-date information on on aquarium keeping. And I also appreciate, like, having someone in person tell you their opinion or their experience on something. It's way easier to, like, weed out the good from the bad that way because it's, like, there are people that I talk about a lot who... (laughs) um, they're just so genuine when they're talking to you about a topic. They're, like, they're passionate and they're excited and they, like the tiniest inkling that someone else could be interested is enough to set them off. (laughs) And that's more than you may want them to sometimes, but it's worth it. Like, listen. (laughs) And those are the people that you should probably be listening to. And then there are people that you right away know, they just want to correct someone. Here's the, here's a fun question. How do you tell the difference between an expert and a novice? If you're just opening up a conversation, because I can think of a few experts in our local aquarium club where you could talk to them for 30 seconds and realize that these guys know what they're talking about and you could talk to somebody else who also has been doing the same stuff and you're like i can see what you've been trying (laughs) most of the experts that i know are kind of humble they don't think they're experts (laughs) right i don't i was about to say the way you worded it where you said this is what i'm trying that's exactly it the people that will be like well, it's not working yet, or mm-hmm. they're like, <laughs> it didn't, these are my failures, or yeah. uh, the type of people that if you come up to them and you ask them, how do you do this? And they, they go, well, this is how you not do this. <laughs> <laughs> failures determine yeah, level right? of expertise pretty dramatically. Yeah, right experts have had the most of failures of anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so that, that brings up kind of an interesting ethical question. And it's one that um, I remember seeing it come up on a forum somewhere when, uh, I don't remember this specific example, but somebody was talking about some new successes with an extremely challenging to keep fish. And I believe it was orange pot file fish. It was one of the the obligatory curlivores. Yeah. But I, I believe it was orange pot file fish. And, and, and that started this whole conversation about, well, I want to try it. Well, I should try it. Well, I should try it. So if this expert is figuring out how to do it, then other people should try that too. And so a lot of those fish in the hobby that we kind of put on the you really shouldn't keep this fish because mm-hmm. they're so difficult to keep. The only reason we have fish in the hobby is because... well. The first fish somebody kept, nobody knew how to keep, and they probably killed some before they figured out how to keep it alive. Yeah. There are articles about, about discus being almost impossible to keep. Now they're bred captivity on a regular basis. So how do you approach an expert versus a beginner saying, let's take a Morris Idol, for example. Right. Morris Idol is one of the most majestic saltwater fish. There. It's iconic. They're incredibly beautiful. I've seen them in the wild. I've swam with them. They're even better in person. They're amazing fish. They do not, up to date, do well in captivity. There are a few success stories, very few success stories. 
I know so many people that say, okay, I'm going to keep a Moorish idol when they're beginning. That's what I want. Like, there was this famous cartoon movie that had a Moorish idol as one of the fish in their fish tank. Yeah, he wanted to get out of that fish tank. Yeah, yeah, because he was going to die and he knew it. (laughs) 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 Uh, That was a little harsh, maybe. (laughs) That was good. Uh, I mean, when when the shoe fits. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, but really, when is it when is it okay to experiment? <laughs> oh man, that just goes into like I guess the justification, you know, like if you you you've got to undertake it with your eyes open. Right. Yeah. I am of the opinion that oh, this is going to be this maybe this Go is. For it. Uh, Beginners should not be the ones experimenting. Who's the beginner? How do you decide? And who decides? If you're setting up your first tank, maybe not the way to go. But a big part of that isn't because I think beginners don't know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. It's because you need to build that experience. Yeah. Because, like, for me, I have projects that... I want to do, but I'm not going to do them now because I have steps in my mind that I need to do to build the skill set so that if something goes wrong, I have experience at a lesser scale yeah. on how to deal with it. Because like for your Corlevoir example, if you're going for a Corlevoir, I say go for it, but also you need to accept the responsibility that if whatever you have planned doesn't work, you're going to be feeding it live coral. Yeah. You need to accept that responsibility to that creature. Yeah. And so you already need to know how to take care of coral, <laughs> you know? So I've got, a, I've got an anecdote of my own from when I was first starting. One of the first tanks I started up, like really early in my aquarium hobby, was a six gallon soft water tank for Betahendra. <laughs> because that's what I wanted and that's why I had identified that as like oh I really like this fish I think I understand how to do this but like there's so many building blocks before any of those things so not only do you need to learn how to maintain an aquarium and feed fish you need to learn how to also maintain a softwater aquarium and feed sensitive fish and then on top of that you need to learn so why not just start with learning how to maintain aquarium and learning how to feed fish? Because that's yeah. enough. Just Google the 10 easiest salt fish to keep and then... <laughs> you know, but, but if you get to that information, you know, I, I don't think that we should encourage beginners away from experimenting necessarily, but, like, master the basics first. Right. And don't add more stress on yourself. Don't start a 10-gallon tank and have to figure out how to keep a giant goldfish in it. Aquarium keeping is both an art form and a science. Which is why I love it. True. And so, like, you don't go straight to painting some 40-foot, like, canvas masterpiece. You, you got to master your primary colors first. First, you got to <laughs> learn how to doodle on a piece of paper. Exactly. Yeah, draw a straight line. <laughs> and, that's, yeah. and that's fine. And you can ramp that up pretty quickly if you practice. You gotta practice. <laughs> practice. That's a good. That's a good way to think it through. Yeah. Practice on zebra Daniels. Right. Because they discus. can take it. You know, we we've been talking talking about the beginner saltwater aquarium a lot, or mm-hmm. the species saltwater aquarium a lot. Practice. Start with something that you know can take your twenty gallon tank, and don't push it. You know, <laughs> or right. do push it, but with your eyes very opened. And have a very specific goal. Yes. Like, don't be... Uh, how am I going to word this? Don't be just <laughs> fiddling just because you want to make something work because you don't like the information out there. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. So there's our, our, that brings us to our third source of information, books. Yeah. It's a lost art. It's a dying art. Mm-hmm. It's still around a little bit. The but books that are 30 years old are some of our best sources of information. So, there's good. So, okay, here's a, here's, a, here's a fun little story. So I've been a member of the Grand Valley Crane Club going on 20 years now. And I joined the board about 15 years ago. 
And when I joined the board, um, there was one of the positions was the uh, program director. That was the person who was in charge of setting up who the guest speaker would be. I was not the program director at the time. At one of the board meetings, everybody stood around and said, hey, the club's doing pretty well. We got a bunch of money in the account. We should bring in some bigger name speakers. And everybody said, yeah, we should do that. And the program director said, yeah, that's a great idea. And nobody did it. And then a year later, the same conversation happened. And I said, huh, I'll do it. And so I started reaching out to what I thought would be big name speakers. And what I simply decided was, if you got a book, you probably know a lot about aquariums, I'm gonna send you an email. It worked. It worked really well. And as a result, I got to know either because I emailed back and forth a couple of times with, or because I actually brought them in as a, as a speaker into the aquarium club, I got to know some of the authors of some of the great aquarium books. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Fenner, of course, is the first one I have to bring up. Uh, we lost Bob Fenner uh, a few months ago. Um, but uh, he, what a great guy. And a number of other speakers we would bring in, and I got to hang out with <laughs> some so of these cool. authors that wrote these books. I have never met, let me, let me rephrase that. I don't think you will ever meet a more dedicated, knowledgeable hobbyist than someone who's willing to take the time it takes oh to gosh. write a book. Yeah, I mean this with all the affection in the world, but I think that people write aquarium books because nobody else in their lives wants to hear them talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so and I gotta mention they Karen put it down Rand for everybody else. <laughs> I gotta mention Karen Randall and her book, and uh, Mike Helwig and his live food book, and of course Bob Fenner, and Anthony Kelfo and uh, Crystal Kasseman's Planted Book. I yeah. mean, we met some of these people. I'm staring at my bookshelf. Uh, Odd Konings, there's... Scott the, Michael is Scott, a personal favorite. Yeah. Michaels, right. It's um, just there's so many people, and that, that small... I mean, compared to the amount of people who are keeping aquariums, the population of people who have written books for aquariums have provided what percentage of our communal knowledge. It is. It's, a, a lot. It's like, the source. Even the stuff that filters down through Seriously Fish and that you'll see, even those random tidbits from like random articles that you'll see have filtered down from those sources. Right. Yeah. Right. So go to the source. <laughs> Reference the books. Amazing group of people. Amazing dedicated group of people. I, yeah. The amount of times I've... Comments? Yes, you did. Okay. Yes, you did. Yeah. The amount of times I've referenced back to like... Wallstead's book when I couldn't remember how two chemicals interacted with each other and she just has that in there like right, right. it's invaluable right <laughs> yeah hard to hard to not tell people to get a book when books are so hard to get these days I mean I guess they're not that hard no. to get. <laughs> but but you can't walk into most aquarium stores and buy aquarium books that's true and a lot of the best books yep. out there are out of print now yeah yeah we, we yeah. need to change that we got to find yeah. how we can get books out to people because like if you want to specialize in a fish that's the way to do that's it, the way to do it. Uh, you're not gonna like you're not gonna get a, a list of every cory cat with its requirements online the way that you would if you read that cory cat book you're probably not gonna even find out that there's over 300 cory yeah. cats yeah yeah and somebody took the time to write them all down and take right. pictures of most of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's actually a little bit of a good segue into the fourth and final source of information, which is another, it's almost as challenging as the internet as a source of information. It's general. <laughs> and that's places that sell aquarium fish. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you can walk into our local grocery store and buy a common pleco, and the list on the tag says it's perfect for a 10-gallon tank. Right. And it's on sale. And it's on sale. If you're lucky, you'll get to talk to somebody, and you'll ask them, hey, is this fish good for my tank? And they'll look at the sign and say, yep. Yep. Here you go. <laughs> and then it gets two feet long. 
And then you go to a big box store Mm -hmm. where at least there's a higher likelihood the people there care a little bit about fish. But you walk into a big box store and you're going to see Paku. Yeah. And goldfish bowls. Yeah. We've touched a little bit on how to determine if an aquarium store or a source of aquarium fish is the one for you. We've talked a little bit about finding the person to talk to and how you do that. But this is probably a good time to get back into it. Like, yeah. <laughs> You know, I think the number one starting point when you walk into an aquarium store, tell them you want something. If they tell you no, you can't have that, you might want to keep listening. Yeah. That's, honest to God, one of my favorite indicators. Yeah. Like, if someone's willing to tell you what you don't want to hear, they're probably being honest to the best of their knowledge anyway. <laughs> yeah, because uh, their incentive is to sell you things. Right. It's yeah. not like people online who might just be negative for the sake of being negative. If they want to sell you something, they will sell it if they can. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I, I, had, I had a customer walk in one day uh, looking for another fish to add to their 12-gallon aquarium. And I asked them, cool, what else do you have in your 12-gallon aquarium? And they said... Two angelfish, a black ghost knife, a common pleco, and a peacock eel. Yikes. Where did you get them? Oh, I got them from the aquarium store down the street. They said it would be a cool combination. In a 300-gallon tank, it would. A, a, a lo- an LFS, yeah. a local fish store. Not, that was not purchased from a big box store. That was not purchased from a grocery store that sells fish. Yeah. That was purchased from an LFS. Here's a good one. If they ask you about your tank. Right. It shows, for one, that they care about your tank, but for two, that they are, like, you, we usually start every conversation with, so tell me about your tank. Right. And it's partially because we're interested, but partially because it tells us about you and it tells us what we can sell you. If I'm poking around in their saltwater department, I'll ask if they have cleaner razes. That's a good one. Yeah, something that you don't think they should carry. Yeah, and do they, rec- do they have it and do they recommend it? Yeah. Um, sourcing is always a good question. Where does this come from? Even if it's not like a conservation thing, like if they know, that's mm-hmm. a really good sign. Right, right. Because um, not everybody at the sales level always knows. But if, they, if your salesperson can't tell you and can't find you someone who can, right. then that's a pretty good sign that they're not being as conscious about their stock as they could be. About 20 years ago, I walked into a, a, an aquarium store about an hour south of town, and uh, they, carried, they had a pretty substantial saltwater department, and I asked them how many of their saltwater fish were captive bred. 20 years ago, clownfish and some dotty back species were commercially available captive bred, and that was pretty much it. And the person I was talking to looked me square in the eye and said, all of our saltwater fish are captive bred. (laughs) Uh, Spoiler alert, they were not. Right. Yes. Um, If you can get someone to say, I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Let me find out for you. Yeah, that's That's a a good sign. mm -hmm. Or uh, around here, it's often, let me go grab person X. Yeah. Because... That's a classic one, and I really like that one. And, and from my own experience, that comes from, I have been doing this for, we'll just say quite some time. <laughs> and, that covers it. And, and people often come to me as the source for advice. And I often say, when I run out of things to learn in this hobby, that's the time for me to hand the keys to the building over to somebody else. So you're going to be working here forever. Right. <laughs> So walking into a fish store and having somebody say, I'm not sure, I don't know the answer to that question, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Yeah. Do you quarantine or do you recommend quarantining? Yeah. If a store says, we don't quarantine and you don't have to either, talk to someone else. Notice yeah. I didn't say find a different store. Talk to somebody else. Yeah. That's, that's a good point because sometimes yeah. there is just that one person. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of 
retail stores, they do operate with a rotating cast of part-time help. Right. And, and that can always be helped in all the areas. We're very lucky to have the staff that we have here. So yes. I don't want to say that every store needs to have that, but they need to have systems in place that provide you with answers. <laughs> Everybody's the new person at some point in their life. Right. Yeah. And I have a great new person story. It wasn't in this store, but when I worked at another store, um, we'd hired in a new person and she was helping a customer and she was having problems like keeping air in the bag when she was trying to put the rubber band on. That's definitely an art. Yeah. It is. And so I walked over and I showed her how to do it. To this day, I still have no idea what possessed me to ask this question. But I looked in the bag and there was a clownfish. And then I looked at the customer and I asked, so do you have a freshwater or saltwater tank? And the customer said, I have a freshwater tank. <laughs> wah, wah. Uh, and, I, and I couldn't blame the girl. It was her first day. She had never worked, like she'd never kept the tank before. Right. And so I was kind of like, all right. All so right. in the future. <laughs> it's hard to start at an aquarium store. That is absolutely true. Because you assume all the customers know more than you do. And that's definitely yes. like. She definitely got through in the deep end. Like. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when I first started here, and I, would, I did not know nearly as much as I like, needed to. So half the time I would be like, oh, you, I know you're in GVAC. You know about this. You talk to them. Like, you know, because being able to say, oh, my, I have no idea what you're asking me right now. Like, I, I just wouldn't even know where to begin making up an answer. <laughs> And it's really important. We're keeping things alive. Yeah, you don't guess. <laughs> Sometimes that, you guess. There's a good... <laughs> this is where I get... Where my anger and my... Uh, anger is such a big word, right? Um, this is where my frustration just comes to such a head. Where when I, when I, when I go somewhere and I hear... Uh, if something is printed on the internet and it's, and it's written out wrong... Mm -hmm. It makes me so mad. Yeah. It makes me so frustrated because when 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 they post that, here's these 18 good beginner saltwater fish. Living things are going to die because of that list. Yeah, it's literally life and death decisions. <laughs> when somebody sells you or sells someone a goldfish bowl with a goldfish in it, something is going to die. Yeah. We make mistakes here. We lose fish. Every single one of them we take it personally. We have literally, me and Bed, stood side by side in the quarantine department, just kind of like staring off into space together because we were so upset by, and this hasn't happened just once, in multiple occasions, we were just like, Ugh, I just, this should have worked. Like w we made a stupid mistake or something and it's just so upsetting. Yeah. Everyone who's in this gets to that point at some point in the, or another where you've got to like, you've got to really like set in the stakes of what we're doing, which we're keeping livestock. We're keeping live animals. We're keeping things that have inherent value. Um, and that's something every person who sells you an animal should be able to recognize the information is out there. Yes. We know how to do this. This is not, yes, there are unknowns in this hobby, but most of the time the information is out there and we know it. Yeah. All right, so here's a call to action and it's a little bit of a scary one and I'm going to take some personal responsibility here myself. Oh, yeah, because that means we're going to have to take responsibility for it too. Gonna. <laughs> I know a lot of you people listening to this right now are hardcore dedicated hobbyists and we all go places where people aren't... I'm going to say it this way, where people are doing, doing it wrong. Where people are disrespectful to the organisms. Disrespectful yeah. to the organisms. We need to start calling people out. So, for my part, I get calls from wholesalers all the time. For example, I get calls from wholesalers that maybe you listen to our podcast, the top ten fish, top five fish that don't belong in the hobby. I will start talking to my wholesalers, talking to people that call me and say, hey, we want to sell you fish. And here's the way to do it. 
I got a call from a wholesaler that I looked at their list and they had five fish that I don't think belong in the hobby. Here's what I should have said and here's what I'll say next time he calls. Yeah. Hey, you want to sell me fish? I would like you to please tell me why you sell Paku. Don't walk into a store. Don't go to somebody's house. Don't talk to another hobbyist and say, what's wrong with you? You're yeah. doing it wrong. Right. Right. Ask them why it's okay to do it that way. Yeah. And I'll do the same. Yeah. I think accountability is incredibly important whenever you're dealing with anything that has to do with animals. But I think, like, even this conversation, we've been talking for an hour, um, and this is all, we're trying to tell hobbyists how to find good information. And if that information was available at the retail and wholesale and collection levels, if there was accountability all the way up, then it wouldn't be on somebody at the grocery store to figure out whether that fish can go in their 10 gallon tank or not. You know, if, if we're putting, if I say we, as in, if the industry is putting the pressure on you as a hobbyist to know everything, then push back (laughs) because it's not just your responsibility. It's every single person in that supply chain. And well said, Amy, that was good. (laughs) That was great. And I, I often hear the, response well they're just fish they're saying that to the wrong group of people i know (laughs) i'm like i'm making a face that's like what where are you coming from and i realize i'm doing that and now i need to convey it but like like going to a dungeons and dragons convention and saying it's just a game yeah right No, it's more than that because these actually are alive exactly that's a bad example no but like the point those people take it just as seriously and those are inanimate objects (laughs) and they're they're living things, but from my perspective, I specifically frame it as not just it's alive, but it's it's got its own versions of hopes and dreams <laughs> and w- like whatever the fish equivalent of that is. And that, just because it exists, deserves to have some respect shown towards it. Like, that's a responsibility. Yeah. Yep. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to cool off for a minute here. It's it's hot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What about, how about a fun story of me learning? Sure, yeah, I shared my uh, sad Betahendra story. I'm I'm looking at those ones downstairs. Maybe I need to try and redeem myself. Uh, I'm definitely looking at a pair for myself, but... One of the things that, like, even if you're not a beginner, you like, we've touched on it a little bit. You're, you're, you're still always learning. Yeah. When I first started working here, I am so fish specific. I had constantly, I'm learning coral on the fly, plants on the fly. Like today, I'm going to be completely honest. We filmed a video where I was talking about one of our planted displays and I probably asked what the pronunciation for like three of those plants like 25 times <laughs> because that's not what I work with and it's new to me and I'm still working on it. But like that's not a bad thing or like I told Ben, I don't know anything about corals and he pulls off this three volume set <laughs> of, there you go. of corals in the world and he says, go to town. And it's like, <laughs> like you just got to accept that you can't know everything, but also that's okay. And that's like, that's the fun of it. That's exciting. Like you don't know everything. How much is there out there to learn? Just keep moving. (laughs) That's amazing. For me, the aquarium hobby is definitely a scenario of like the philosophy, leave them wanting more. And I'm like, well, there's always more. Like, and like, this is like one, just one part of our earth. Like, and there's just it's infinite like there's you could dive into literally the tiny millimeter sized things to keep and that's like the some of the stuff that i've been playing around with lately and like everything up to giant stuff there's unlimited possibility in every part of it (laughs) it's amazing so learn about it (laughs) learn it that's it live in it my philosophy is here is live and learn yeah and learn (laughs) 
Well, there we go. That was kind of a, kind of a little bit of a harder one. Yeah. So I challenged, but the big thing is keep on learning. Mm-hmm. Cross-reference. Know your source. Let's keep trying to have fun. And let's keep those hands wet.